And now we're going to talk about the broader picture um, about Israel and Hamas and the dire situation in, in, in the country. And with us we have Mark Toth, national security and foreign policy expert. Good evening, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good evening, Anya and Sasha. Thank you. Now, uh, Mark, the uh, situation in Gaza continues to be dire. Uh, we have reports of terrible suffering. Now, whatever sources you hear, even if they're uh, totally accurate or not, I mean, there are many countless thousands of uh, Gazans who have perished, uh, who are suffering. Uh, there seems to be famine, which is the next plight in this, uh, in this area of the world. Um, given the situation the last week, and um, now I think the fear of what might be happening with Rafa, with the idea of moving in there, uh, how much worse can it really get before this all ends? Uh, Sasha, it is indeed a tragic situation. Uh, it's not yet completely clear what we're seeing. Uh, certainly in the past, Hamas and its supporters have tried to weaponize words, be it genocide and the like. Um, and, and we're not quite sure yet whether or not famine is, is indeed being weaponized in a similar fashion. That said, it does seem to be increasingly clear, uh, based on my survey and even Israeli media, that there is immense humanitarian suffering inside of the Gaza Strip. So it's incumbent upon Israel, one way or the other, to get ahead of that curve, mm -hmm. because certainly it's not in their interest, short term or long term, to be perceived as uh, participating in any kind of genocide, which a mass star starvation of Gazans would be. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, again, uh, it, to, to put an exclamation point on that, we don't know exactly what we're seeing yet, but it's a disturbing trend, and we don't know who primarily is responsible for it yet uh, in terms of the Israeli side, but we do know that Hamas is primarily responsible for it in the sense that they started this war. They, they are the mm -hmm. entity that the Gazans elected to govern them. They are the entity that uh, declared war in effect on October 7th. And, and they are the entity responsible for protecting its citizens as long as they continue to uh, uh, conduct this war back against Israel. So uh, a terrible humanitarian situation and, and not one easily understood uh, given the lack of info currently. All right. Now, without a question, what, what happened on October 7th was horrible to all Israelis, all those people who were kidnapped, who were raped, who were killed. Um, and it's not a, um, you know, it's obvious that Israel wants to get uh, the uh, Hamas members who are responsible for this. But the question is, and it's quite a difficult question, but many people ask, maybe many people are wondering, I mean, so, ma so many people in Palestine, in Gaza, had to die for Israel to get few members of, of, of Hamas. I mean, is this necessary? I mean, we know how... Mm, how great Israeli's intelligence is. I mean, can they just get them any other way? Is this necessary for so many people to be killed um, by IDF? You know, I, I think it's, a, it, it's an important question, Anya. I think it's a question uh, in, in terms of how you answer it, uh, how you look at this conflict. If you look at it purely as a reprisal, uh, kind of a tit for tat, if you will, with Israel trying to get at the individuals who conducted it, uh, it might seem out of proportion. But this isn't what we're seeing here. What we're seeing here is total war. Uh, it's no different than what Russia has done to Ukraine and that they attacked Ukraine. And, and similar to how some, you know, apologists or Putin apologists in the West keep saying, don't blame Putin. I'm sorry, don't blame uh, Putin for invading Ukraine because Ukraine or NATO made him do it, or, you know, mm -hmm. in the case of Belarus, saying Poland made him do it. Uh, it, it really comes back to the, the, the key point that Hamas started this. And, and Hamas is not just a terrorist organization. As I just mentioned, they are the elected government of, of the Gaza Strip. Uh, they won an election. The people chose that. And they chose to take that power to militarize and to create a sufficient military force that has threatened Israel continually, not just on October 7th, which, as you pointed out, was heinous and, and unacceptable in terms of the atrocities that they inflicted, but the numerous rock attacks, rocket attacks that have been ongoing before and after, and still even sporadically continue to this day. So the, the dilemma is, uh, for those of us that are looking at this from a military perspective, is that this is, is not a, a tit-for-tat situation. It's war. 
And, and unfortunately, in war, it is incumbent upon the parties that commit it to protect their own populations. And Israel did give uh, the citizens of the Gaza Strip advance warning to flee certain areas that they were going to. Yeah, to, but Mark, yeah, on, on that subject, I mean, I agree with uh, what you're saying in terms of, um, you know, mm -hmm. the reaction of, of course, we, we need to debate this much longer about what, what is uh, the right. ethics of war, etc. But at the same time, as you said, you know, some of those Gazans may have been given notice, but I mean, with them really nowhere being able to flee to, uh, literally on the border, Egypt won't let them in. Uh, so, I mean, it also, I think that would be another element to look at. How much is Egypt then liable for those who've also died? And of course, that's a different question. But I want to just go into what you said earlier. Uh, today, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu said that no force in the world will stop Israeli troops from entering Rafah. That's today. We know that that's the red line that the U.S. keeps saying that there is. But at the same time, we have this idea of dissent forming also within Israel. And I think former Prime Minister Emud Olbert said this today as well, that he believes that Netanyahu is running his governing coalition and the war in Gaza on the basis of personal interest and order remain in power. So how much of an element of that do you see here, of uh, an, an, a, a prime minister who very much is doing something for himself rather than for the state? I mean, those lines are blurred, but how much do these two prime ministers here clash and what the reality is? Uh, you know, Sasha, it, it's an important question. I mean, certainly we are seeing the pol and domestic politics of Israel play out in this crisis. They were there before it began. They, they somewhat went to the background uh, after October 7, but they're starting to resurface. And it's not yet clear what Netanyahu really means. Yes, he is saying that a date has been set. Yes, he's very adamant that Rafa will be attacked. And, and from a war standpoint, you know, he's correct. You can't leave Hamas standing in Rafa, or else why have you done all of this? If you're just simply going to destroy half the country, which has happened, and not just Israel doing that, but Hamas doing that to their own country, if you leave them to reconstitute themselves uh, because they survived in, Hamas, uh, in Rafa to fight another day, that doesn't make any strategic sense from a war standpoint. Uh, now, from a political standpoint, it's just not yet clear what Netanyahu's end game here is. Mm -hmm. I'm not inside of his head. You know, I have lived in Israel. I do understand the people. I get the political calculus that might be at play with him, that he's wanting to try to survive politically. But I also get the political calculus of others like Omar, uh, who is, is basically trying to use this uh, as an opportunity to oust uh, Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's going to have to play out domestically in Israel. Um, but it doesn't negate the issues that come about in terms of what's needed to win this war. Yeah, indeed. And I think there's so many layers to this. I think also we'll be talking more about it also with the uh, case right now going through the international court there with uh, Germany and Nicaragua as well. So this just adds more and more layers. We'll have to conclude it there. Thank you so much, Mark Toth there. Uh, appreciate your insights. It Thanks. is. And my deep, my deep condolences to the family of Dam Damien Sobel. A Thank you. Tragic and, and certainly a heroic man. That's Thank right. you. We really appreciate that.